today as we celebrate and uh, remember um, Palm Sunday, uh, this day, you know, take it from the Gospels is where, you know, the whole city just came in and, and they threw a big parade for Jesus. As Jesus, you know, he was, you know, rode on, on this donkey down into the city. People threw palm branches and their clothes and and uh, they laid down their cloaks, which, you know, represented their identity. They laid them down in anticipation of his coming. And this is where we get the word Palm Sunday because, they, they, you know, as the word says, they went into the fields and they cut branches to lay before him as they were welcoming the king into the city. This day, it, it was really marked with a day of celebration where Jesus, you know, this was that moment to where, you know, he was worshipped, he was being praised and you know, all the, those who were coming into to the city to celebrate the Passover, you know, they had already heard about the many miracles, the, 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 the you know, raising the dead to life, the, the deaf to hear, the lame to walk. You know, they knew all that was going on. And so they were like, yes, this is Jesus coming into the city. And they came and they welcomed him and began to shout, Hosanna, Hosanna. You know, you know, and, and which you know meant if we if we study that word out, it means that uh, you know the one, uh, you know, our Savior, the one who saves us, and so this was a, a great day of celebration. But this day is bittersweet for us because, as we read of the celebration, we already know what's coming. We already know that, man. Jesus, it's just a few days away and, and, and Friday's coming. And we know what's getting ready to happen. The cross is coming. And we know that many in this same crowd, within a few short days, they begin to exchange the words of praise to words of death. Shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then later on, Crucify him! Crucify him! This morning I want us to focus our attention on two scriptures, both focused upon Jesus, but with two different results. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want you to turn first to Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 36. Luke chapter 19, we're going to begin in verse 36. When you're there, shout a big amen. 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 All right, put your thumb there. Now I want you to flip back to Matthew chapter 27, verse 15. Matthew chapter 27, verse 15. We're going to look at these two paragraphs and see a stark difference between the two. Let's read first Luke chapter 19. As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road, of heaven, a road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles that they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the he highest heaven. Now turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. This was but a few days later. Beginning in verse 15. Now it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner to the crowd. Anyone they wanted. This year there was a notorious prisoner, a man named Barabbas. And as the crowds gathered before Pilate's house that morning, he asked them, Which one of you do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? 
He knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of envy. Just then, as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent this terrible this message to him. Leave that innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. Verse 20. Meanwhile, the leading priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released, for Jesus to be put to death. So the governor asked again, which of these two do you want me to release to you? And the crowd shouted back, Barabbas. And Pilate responded, then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? And they shouted back to him, crucify him. Father, we thank you for your word. This morning as we open your word, God, I pray, Lord, that you also open our hearts. Bring revelation to us, Lord. And God, I pray that you would just allow us, Father, to receive your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Billy Graham. He was quoted many times as saying that the greatest mission field in our country today is in our local church, the people sitting already in our churches. I think there's some truth to that. I don't know whether this statement is true, but one thing that I do know is that many people know what to say, how to say it, even how to act it. But when the rubber meets the road, there is no personal relationship with Jesus, no salvation, just empty words. This is the same thing that we see within these two scriptures. On Sunday, Jesus rode in Jerusalem and the people were beginning to shout praises praising God for all the wonderful miracles that they had seen. <clears throat> but on Friday, they're shouting, give us Barabbas. We want him. Crucify Jesus. Crucify him. Well, why was this, why was this such a drastic change? How could it go that on one day they were welcoming him and, and celebrating all that he was doing and recognizing him as the Messiah. But only a few short days later, their, their hearts and their minds just transformed and say, you know what? No, let's just, go, let's just go ahead and kill him. Let's just go ahead and crucify him. Even against, you know, the, uh, you know, the vile, those who have, you know, been in, in prison and do, you know, such, you know, terrible things. No, we're, we're, we're going to let him go, but we want to kill Jesus. Why, why, why? How did, how did we get to this point? Their words, they didn't match their heart. They possessed a, a casual, not a committed faith. You know, if we had just had a casual faith in God, we're so easily swayed by the opinions of who surrounded us. But if I have a committed faith, I'm able to stand in my belief, no matter what the circumstances and the, 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 the folks around me are going to declare. They had a religion, but they missed this person, Jesus. So how, how can we, if we personalize this, how can we have a committed faith? How can we be real and, and, and how can we truly be sincere? How can we be consistent in all that we do? Because I think if we were to, to be honest and reflect ourselves and, and, and reflect within ourselves, I think that we can probably put ourselves at some point in each of these scenarios, in each of these scriptures. I know that there's times in my personal life to where 
man, I am all, absolutely on fire for God. I know who he is. I know what he did. I celebrate him. I proclaim his word. But I know that there's also times in which I really struggle. I say, come on, God. I, 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 I know you're a loving God, but come on. Let's be real here. This, this hurts. And I can be in that same boat. And so I, I, I can try to relate to how people just within days, okay, because it comes down to fiction. But how, how can I move my faith to be that when it's committed, even when things are great, to even when those times to where they're not so great? I don't know about you, but I want a faith that does not waver. I want a faith that, that I can stand firmly upon the word of God no matter what the circumstance and trust in him. So this morning I want to offer a few keys that I believe that we can have such faith. The first thing that I want to talk about this morning is first key, if you will. The first key is that a committed faith is not self-centered, and it's not Christ, or it is Christ-centered. I know that this sounds pretty obvious to us, but we often miss it. Sometimes we say to God, you know, hey God. Here is where my calendar is. This is what my agenda is. God, here's where you fit into my life. God, in a Sunday, maybe even a Wednesday, a Thursday, sometime in there, I make it, I, I dedicate that time to you. And we kind of weave God and, and we, we, we put him into our life. We put him into our circumstances. Turning to God only when it's convenient or only when it's useful. In our scriptures that we read this morning, the people praised Jesus as he passed by, but many of them praised him for two reasons. Number one, they praised him because of the miracles that they saw. They, they, they were like praising him, you know, saying, you know, God did all of these different things, and they're praising him for the miracles. He had healed the sick, he raised the dead, and he praised him because why? He was serving them. Think about that for a moment. Do we get like this? It's easy to praise somebody when they serve us. <coughs> Unintentionally, I, I, I've been praising our, you know, I think it's great when we praise people. You know, we, 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 we want to do this, but I believe that one of the elements of why they were, when he's coming down the road, it's like, oh, Jesus, you've been doing all kind of good. You saved my loved ones. You healed them. You did things for me. And therefore, I will praise you. How many times is that true in our life? We praise him when the, when the blessings come. We praise him when things are going well. We'll give him our glory when all, all things line up and say, yeah, God, you did this. I'll give you the glory. Because he did something for us. But they also, I believe that the, another reason was because they saw in Jesus a way to be delivered politically from the Romans. You know, as, as you know, they saw this, you know, he was the king. You know, they were labeling him, this is the king of the Jews. He's, a, he's the king. 
you know, the, the Messiah that's coming down. It's like, okay, here comes a new king. Things are getting ready to, to, to change, right? How many times do we do this in our political system when there's a new president coming in, into office? Oh, okay. oh things are getting ready to change. We elevate them, right? They, they become our new Messiah. They're going to change the, you know, the, the, the world. Things are going to get better. Half of us think things are going to be better. The other half, things are going to get worse. But this was the same in, in which, you know, it's almost as the Jews, when Moses led them out of Israel, they were thinking, oh, Jesus, he's going to lead us away out of the captivity and the rule of Rome. He's going to fix things. So not only are they praising him because this one was serving them, he's also, they're also praising him because he's their ticket out of their situation. But a few days later, at the trial, they saw a beaten and disfigured Jesus, a man with who, who he no longer, you know, oh, well, you obviously, I mean, could you imagine they standing there and they're looking at this Jesus, the one that they were praising, is like, you're going to be our deliverer, but now you're just beaten, you're just a, 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 a ball of flesh, you're not going to do anything for us. So when Jesus, we, we see that he's not going to do anything for us, what does their, what does their focus turn to? See you later. You can't do anything for me. Now look how helpless you are. You can't even help yourself. How are you going to help me? And do we see the, where the self-centeredness of faith comes in? When we make our faith self-centered about ourselves and not centered on Christ, ouch. We begin to falter. Just empty words. Today, as we celebrate Palm Sunday 2022, we want to choose to honor Jesus Christ by giving him our very best, not holding out of anything, but giving him our all. So this first key is a committed faith is not self-centered, but it's Christ-centered. The second key that I want to talk about today is that a committed faith is relationship-driven. See, many of those who are gathered, they threw their coats and palm branches onto the street, and they began to shout praises, and they did so because it was a popular thing to do at the time. When everybody comes out to do it, how many know it's like, man, this, is, this becomes easy. It's easy to begin to shout praise when everybody else is doing it. At that one brief moment, it was almost as if it was trendy. Yeah. Hey, come on out to the road. Go get you a branch. Come and throw your coat on the ground again. Here come Jesus. It was a cool thing to do. All the city, they were coming out. You know that Jesus, he's coming down there. Oh, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to lay our coats and our palm branches, and we're going to welcome him into the city. How many know that we can always get caught up easily into the next trendy thing that's happening? That brief moment became trendy. Perhaps some began doing it with sincere motives, but others... They soon did it because others were doing it. At the trial, it was the same thing. Crucify him was the thing to do. In fact, for a brief moment, when it was the trendy thing to do to make a mass murderer and criminal their hero, when they shouted that they wanted Barabbas, do you think that this still happens today? People get on the latest bandwagon. Things get real trendy. We get caught up in the world. We get caught up on all kind of 
social things that, and man, we, we, we got to jump on it, and man, that's all we talk about. Because it's a trendy thing to do. It's what we're, it's what the, the topic is of the day. And we begin talking about the topic and we become involved in what it is when we normally wouldn't if it wasn't surrounding us all the time. You know, this happens and, it, and, it, and it's so easy. But in our own lives, a committed faith comes only through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. One where every day is fresh and new as he personally directs our steps. When we have that personal relationship with Jesus, it's no longer self-centered, becomes Christ-centered. When we have that personal relationship with Jesus, it doesn't matter, you know, what the, the you know, our, our relation is with the world. We're related to Christ and we're driven by that relationship that we have with Christ more than any other thing in the world. It doesn't matter what's happening around us. It doesn't matter the the latest trend, the latest fashion, or the latest, you know, topic of the day, the headline. In order to have that committed faith, we must develop and maintain a personal relationship with Jesus. That's not always easy in this world. But we have to spend the time. We have to put in the effort. How many know relationships take a, they take a little bit of work? Right? They, they just don't happen. And, 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 and think that, man, we're, we're going to get together and everything is going to be, you know, perfect and peaches. I think that we have our thoughts of, of what that perfect relationship looks like. And as we... To be, begin to develop and uh, you know have relations with one another. We see, man, it's great until you talk. <laughs> it's great until you say something that I don't agree with. It, 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 it's great all the other times, but we got to work some things between us. We have to work some things out. We have to work at this. And, you know, what resonates with you, even though it doesn't resonate with me, we are still are one and we have to resonate together. And so relationships, they take a lot of work. Our relationship with Jesus, it takes a lot of work. It takes time. It takes effort. You know, we, we got to get into his word. We got to, you know, to spend time with him. I mean, it's impossible to have a relationship with somebody if you don't want to ever spend time with them. I want to talk today just to, about this last key. And that is the committed faith isn't swayed by personal trials or crises. At the triumphal entry, it was trendy to offer praise. Everyone was doing it, but at the trial, to speak out for Jesus, it was risky. Possibly even, you know, it meant that you yourself were going to die, because if you were going to speak up for Jesus, this meant, hey, wait a minute, you're with him? Well, you're going to die too. We see Peter begin to deny even his relationship with him as, as being associated with Jesus. Most of us come to Jesus expecting everything to be good. Maybe some come with maybe a slightly more realistic expectation, thinking, well, it's just going to be better than it was. So, during those moments, because I don't know about you, but there's been times after I've been saved that my world was rocked. I remember giving my heart to Jesus, and I remember distinctly that I did so because I needed the hope that only he could offer. And I knew that if I could hold on to that hope, 
And if I served him with, with my life, that I could receive that hope and I could hold on to that hope that it's going to be better than what it was. My marriage is going to be better than what it was. My life is going to be better than what it was. My hope is that I'm not going to go to hell. I'm going to be with him eternally in heaven. It's a hope that we have, right? I don't know anybody in here hope we go to hell. Don't raise your hand to that. No, we hope for something better than what it is. And, 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 and so it's natural, I believe, that in our lives, that when we give our hearts to Jesus, that we naturally think, hey, it's, it's going to get better. Now, I don't want to rain on anybody's parade, but sometimes it's not as better as what we think. Sometimes persecution comes. Sometimes, all the time, it begins to really convict us that we have to make some hard choices in our lives. Let me tell you, that is not easy. That's not the easy part to salvation. When we have to look personally at our own sin and begin to deal with that and wrestle with it, that's not always the things that we like to do. We think that because we serve the King of Kings, the Lord is Lord's, that, that somehow, you know, that, that, that nothing is going to harm us or nothing's going to happen. But, you know, when, when, when we get sick, when we fall, it's like, God, how? Why? But this committed faith, as we spend time in it, and it's built upon relationship, this committed faith, when trials and these crises come that it's not swayed. If our faith is based on our situation or circumstances, it will never be committed. It will always be casual. We can't base our relationship with Jesus on just how we feel for the day. How if things are all going well, well, then I got a good relationship with Jesus. But when things are in crisis and I'm in a bad situation and I don't know what, what tomorrow's going to look like, I can't think that somehow my relationship with Jesus is bad. But we often feel that way. How many people have ever been to you know, conferences, or maybe you've been to, a, you know, a, a concert, a worship conference, and, you know, you just got, you know, hundreds of people, maybe even thousands of people, all worshiping in one accord, and man, you know, how, how many people, I'm, I'm going to date some of you guys, all right, this, this was Brian before Christ, but how many people remember Promise Keepers, right? Yes. How many people ever came to Christ during Promise Keepers? I know what to hear but let me tell you, that was a big movement. A lot of people came to Christ. A lot of people were on fire. That, and, and they looked at that time because you were in a surrounding that, that so many um, you know, men were, were coming together and, and declaring their faith. And man, when you're in that situation, wow, powerful things happen. When you, you go to camp, you know, you go to a men's conference, you go to a women's conference. Man, the surrounding, the presence, and then the anointing, the blessings. I mean, just things flowing, people being healed. There's all kind of amazing things that are happening in, during this event. But then it ends, and you walk out the door. And as soon as you pull your device out of your head, you're back to reality of, of trying to figure out, oh my goodness. I didn't know that bill was due. Oops. What am I going to do with my car payment? Oh my goodness, now they're going to come get my car. I don't get paid for another three weeks. Whatever it is, we begin to have our mind and, and we are out of that environment. Those environments are great when we're collectively together and there's a spirit of unity that comes. But what happens during, in our faith when we have to be able to commit, you know, to, to and, and when we are surrounded by life, Circumstances. We face these hard tasks. Can we still praise Him in a world that is fallen? 
Can we still be among non-believers and still begin to praise Him? You know, when, when, when we're you know associated, we, we, you know, we're surrounded by such negativity around it and such ungodly things. Can we still remain in His presence? We can if we have that committed faith. A committed faith takes the good with the bad. So knowing that all we are ever promised is that in the midst of both our good and our bad, Jesus will never leave us nor forsake us. He's going to stand with us. We often think, God, how did I get here? Think about the path that he's had you on and all the circumstances that have lined up to bring you to a place of, how did you get here? How did you get here to where you are? When we look at this, God has placed you exactly where you are, and, and he has brought you to this place for such a specific time and season. You are walking in his will. You are walking in his plan. And we have to trust him in this. We are, are, are trusting him through our situations, our trials. But by trusting him, we eventually see that he is using our situations and he's using the trials, he's using the difficulties to begin to bring us to a new degree of spiritual beauty. You see, true contentment comes when we accept that God is doing and we begin to just thank him for it. I don't have God figured out. And I've come to the realization that I'm never going to figure him out. And it's not my place to do that in the first place. But it's my place to trust in him. It's my place to have a committed faith in him. It's my place to trust him when the world around me is shouting crucify him. That I'm not praising him for the reasons of just being trendy and going with it. But I'm praising him because that's what my heart and my spirit desires to do. Because I have a true, authentic relationship with him. I've shared that when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, I really questioned it. You know, as I, as I was saved, I, 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 I've heard the term speaking in tongues, and I had always heard that in a negative context. That when somebody spoke in tongues, that that was a, that was a crazy thing. Anybody ever grow up kind of thinking that? Okay. Yeah. So when I was saved, I began to read his word, and I began to, you know, as my faith is growing, I'm reading his word, I'm God, I'm seeing your word as something different than what my thoughts have always been. And that challenges me. I have, to, I have to challenge my own thinking on that, right? But when I see that this is a gift that God has given and that he has poured out his spirit, and, and that, that when we see that his spirit was poured out and someone was baptized in the Holy Spirit receiving this gift, that there was an evidence of an unknown tongue being expressed. <coughs> I can't argue with that. That's his word. But I think I doubt it. And so when I was in one of those situations, I went to this men's conference. We were in Hartford City. So all these guys coming around and this speaker, it was actually Jeff Swain with Convoy of Hope now. 
he was the speaker at this time, and he began to, to share, and, and he was talking about this baptism, receiving this gift. Oh, I got a lot of, I got a lot of questions about this. How do I know it's, it's God, and how do I know it's not me? How do I, how do I know when I'm filled? How do I know? How do I, how do I, how do I? Anybody ever been there? Okay. Good company. But as one of those thoughts came to my head, the Holy Spirit was allowing this speaker to speak directly addressing that into me <laughs> and answering them, not out loud. I mean, he was speaking out loud, but I was just thinking these thoughts in my mind. But every one of them began to be answered. And I, with, with confidence that, okay, I get that. That's something that I did not know, that now I know, then I know that I know. And so the time came, and you know, he's like, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to receive this, this evidence of speaking in tongues, but it's this empowerment that, that comes in, of, of so many other aspects of my life. You're ready to receive this. And, and I was a knucklehead, even in my, my early years of, of you know, being a Christian. You know, and, and I, I hope that you are like this too. I, I truly do. Because I, I, I was always one to maybe just go a little bit against the grain. And, you know, if, if, if I'm in your shoes and the pastor says, let's, come on, church, let's raise our hands. I wasn't raising my hands. I'm not doing what somebody else is going to tell me to do. I want to do it on my own. You're okay if you did not raise your hands when I said, come on, church, let's raise our hands. If you want to go against that, that's fine. I did because I wanted it to be authentic. I wanted everything that, that I did, I wanted it to be of God. Now this is, <laughs> I'm just being a little bit vulnerable before you, but this is what happened to me. Is he was, you know, that the, the speaker says, hey, you want to receive this gift, come on. And I come up and I'm just standing there just like this. Hands in my pocket. God, you got something? Give it to me. Come on. <laughs> I was. And, it, and there was this, this dude, he came up to pray for me. And his dad, I remember, we called him Big Jim. He was a big dude. All right, Big Jim. Pray. I'll receive it. Give it to me. What you got? Guess what I got? Nothing. Not a single thing. Big Jim's just praying his heart out. I'm just standing there. God, you're going to give me something. Give it to me. As he kept praying and other people began to pray and feeling this stirring, this heat start rising out. Oh my God. For real now. If you want to feel me, you want me to start talking and saying things that I don't know what I'm going to talk about. Just make it happen. Nothing happened. Somewhere in there, I had the brilliant idea what if I just began to thank God? What if I just began to praise Him on my own? Not because of anything that anybody was encouraging me to do. There's nothing wrong with somebody encouraging you, okay? But when, it, when my heart lined up with that, and I said, God, I truly do praise you. And I began just to lift my hands on my own accord, not because anybody was saying, do this or do that, or, you know, trying to encourage me. All well, all thinking. But it was as soon as I took my stinking hands out of my pocket and began to lift them that I began to speak in an unknown language, and I began to leap in joy, and I had a fire from the head, top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Oh, my goodness. The Holy Spirit just was filled me from top to bottom. I started leaping and jumping and praising Him and just speaking in, in tongues. And I'm like, whoa, God. But it wasn't until my heart, it came from my heart and nothing else. It was a heart issue that I had. Because the relationship that I had with Him, you know, 
We're still, we're still learning, right? I'm still trying to figure all this stuff out. But our relationship with Him, it has to begin so personal, so authentic, so real. I don't want you to ever feel swayed. I don't want you to ever feel, I, I, I'm going to encourage you, all right? I'm going to encourage you to raise your hands. I'm going to encourage you to come to the altar. I'm going to encourage you to, you know, just change your situation. Why? Because I know that sometimes that's what we need. But I don't want you to ever do something because I am encouraging to do it if your heart isn't in agreement with what I'm saying. Does that make sense? I want you, I want your heart, however that is, whatever that looks like, I want that to be the preemptive factor of why you are doing something in your relationship with God. I want your hands to be raised, not because the person next to it is doing it. I want you to raise your hands because you feel that, you know, that I am here in the presence of God and I don't know how to worship you except to do this or to, to, to shout out or to dance or, you know, to, to lay down. I don't know what it is that you worship God, but I want you to feel the freedom to do that. That's, that's, what, that's what a relationship is all about. So I hope that these keys of talking about this committed relationship have resonated. Remember that the key to a committed faith, it's not self-centered, but it's Christ-centered. That a committed faith, it's driven by our relationship and our relationship with Jesus. And that it isn't swayed by trials and crisis and situations around us. But this morning as we close, is your faith casual or is it committed? Think about where you would have been on that day when Jesus rode down into the city. When he was riding down you knew the miracles, but when he was coming into the city, put yourself in this place. Would you have worshipped him and praised him for what he's doing out of a heart that is in relation with him? Or is it one that is just in casual Hey, this is what everybody's doing. So we're going through this Holy Week as we're approaching the time to where Jesus suffered incredibly for us in a week where our sins, our past, our present, our future, all these were nails that hung him on the cross. Doesn't Jesus deserve a second look? Doesn't he deserve a total control over our lives? Doesn't he deserve a personal relationship with you? So as we go into this week, I encourage you that we have to consider this for ourselves. We have to consider everything that he did and I pray that you would just choose to give it everything. Commit yourself. How many know Jesus committed himself? We're no different. Let's pray this morning. It's in your own moment between you and the Lord. I'm going to challenge you. And when I challenge you, I mean encourage you in love to really consider your relationship with Jesus. Would you say that you have a casual relationship with God? He's just kind of there when you need him? You fit him in where you need him? Or do you have that committed relationship with him that you know that no matter what, 
comes, no matter what situation may arise, no matter what the world around us tells you, that you're going to stand upon your faith because your faith is committed on Him. Where are you at? This isn't something that changes in a, in a prayer, in a church service, as we're closing. This is something that I want you to reflect all week on. And that as we move into this time of remembering all that Jesus did, his arrest, his betrayal, his arrest, and, and the trials, his crucifixion, all for the sake of our sin. I want you to consider is, did he casually go into that for me or did he faithfully committed himself to go and endure that for me it was the latter and I think that our relationship with him should be the same committed wholeheartedly you know what God has called you to do you know the things that he stirred in your heart being casual and dismissing it doesn't mean that he didn't speak it. Let's go and love on people. Amen.